I want to talk about listening to the Spirit. And I think we all know that we ought to be listening to the Spirit. But often we don't know how. We don't know what that means. We don't know uh, how that would actually work itself out in practice. So we'll begin with the saying of Jesus to understand what the role of the Spirit is. He says the Helper, sometimes called the Comforter, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Now keep in mind, Jesus at this moment is not talking to us. Perhaps we could bring it down just a little bit, uh, echoing. But Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he's saying, when I'm gone, I'll still be here. Because the Holy Spirit will continue teaching you. And the Holy Spirit will bring remembrance of the things that I said to you while I was here. So the role of the Holy Spirit is to tell us what we couldn't get any other way. Now we realize, as Seventh-day Adventists, that the uh, Bible is the primary place where we go for the Word of God. But one thing perhaps we don't emphasize enough is the limitations of the Bible. For example, the Bible is episodic. It's case studies. It's a series of stories of how God deals with some very messy situations. And if you've done any Bible reading, you know that there's some really messy situations going on. And so the Bible is not teaching us, okay, here's how you're supposed to think. Here's how you're supposed to feel. Most of the time, the Bible is just saying, here's some people doing their thing, and God steps in. And hopefully you'll get the point. It'll be useful to you at some point. The Bible rarely speaks directly to our challenges. For example, if you're a teenager this morning, there's probably three questions in your mind that the Bible can't answer. What would those be? What kind of profession will I take one day? Where will I live? Who will I marry? You won't find the answers to that in the Bible. So the Bible teaches us many important things, great principles, but it rarely speaks directly to our daily challenges. Some of our questions don't get answered there. That's where the Spirit comes in. The Bible can help us rule out some things. No, don't go there. <laughs> That's going to result in a big mess. All right? The Bible can rule out some things, but often the choices that we face are not directly addressed by the Bible, and that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. So the question would be, how do we actually listen to the Spirit, and how would we know when the Spirit is speaking to us? There we go. So how does the Spirit talk Today, we have examples in the Bible, but how does the Spirit talk today? And another way to frame that question is, would you know God's voice if you heard it? If God actually came to you and said, I'm going to tell you something that you need to know and need to do, would you recognize it? Would you know that that was God speaking to you? Let's do a couple of case studies. All right, you're a farmer, and you're standing at the edge of the field, and you're looking out, and it's beautiful, and you feel a strong impression from God. You feel it. Plant corn instead of wheat this year. Would you do it? If you knew that it was God, would you do it? What's the question? How do you know if it's God that's impressing you at that point? 
All right, right. Another, another case, case study. study. You're, You're a mom. mom. You, you got, got three kids. kids. You, you got, got a part-time part job. job. Life, Life is one chaos, chaos after another, and one day you sense the presence of God telling you, invite your husband's elderly parents to move in. Would, Would you do it? it? If, if you, you knew, knew it was God, would, would you do it? it? But how, how would you know if it was truly God? God? All right. Or, or you're, you're the church, church treasurer. And, and as you're, you're working, working over the church books, books you feel this overwhelming sense that God wants you to cash out all the church's resources and send it to the mission field. Would you do it? If you knew it was God, would you do it? But how would you know? That's the big question. We're encouraged to listen to the Spirit. The Spirit will teach us all things. But how do you know when the Spirit is speaking to you? A messy biblical story. A rancher getting on in years with a favorite son. And in the middle of the night, he hears a voice speaking to him. Take your son, your only son, your darling son. Take him to the place that I will show you. When you get there, stab him to death with a knife. Would you do it? If you knew it was God, would you do it? How did Abraham know? Seems to me that's relevant for us today. How on earth did Abraham know that the voice that was telling him to go directly against the truth of God's word was the voice of God? How did he know? How could you or I know if we're ever faced with a similar situation? How does the Spirit talk today? Well, let's bring it up to today. I don't know if Tammy recognizes that vehicle. She was about five at the time that we bought it, but it was a Plymouth Voyager. And when you've got three kids, it helps to have a little extra space when you're moving down the road. But of course, being cheap and not hugely endowed with resources in any case, we got the, the base model with the four-cylinder engine and the standard transmission, you know? Saving money every step of the way, right? And so it comes time to take a road trip. We were going to leave our home in Berrien Springs, Michigan. We were going to head west and uh, go to a number of places in the west, do a little preaching here and there, uh, have a little family fun. Looking forward to that? Not this time. Usually I'm really excited when it's time for a trip. I love getting on the road. It was mentioned in the introduction. He likes travel when he's not busy working. Love, Love to get, get on, on the road, road. new adventures, adventures, meet new people, see, see new places. places. Not, Not this time. time. I, I had this overwhelming sense of dread. I didn't, didn't tell anyone, anyone. Didn't, didn't tell my wife, didn't, didn't tell Tammy. I didn't, I didn't know what to do with that. that. This overwhelming sense of dread facing this trip. I didn't know where that came from, why. But, but we, we took, took our van, van and we headed out. And when we passed through Illinois, Wisconsin, North Dakota, Montana. And guess what happens when you get to Montana? You start facing some steep climbs on the interstate that four-cylinder vans aren't super prepared to handle. And, and as, as we began, began getting into the mountains, mountains on Interstate 94 there, 
we'd be struggling and struggling, and the speed would go from 65 to 50 to 40 to 30 to 20, and somewhere around 15 to 17 miles an hour was about where we would hit on some of these steep uphills. You see? And then, of course, you come over the top, and wee, boy, is that fun, heading down. You, you can act like you got a V16 under the hood, you see? So we were, this is what we were doing. We were creeping up the mountains and running down, trying to make up the time, of course, as safely as possible. And then this happened. Ever seen one of those? Guess what? They don't do so well on those mountains either. This guy was doing about 15 miles an hour up one of those hills. And it was two lanes each direction heading up this mountain pass. And we were side by side. You know, going about 15 miles an hour. We were on the right, he was on the left. He was trying to pass us, but then when it was not so steep, when it was really steep, he was more powerful than I was, but when it was not so steep, we started creeping ahead. And as we're going along, it's sort of going back and forth for a couple of minutes. And all of a sudden, I saw flashing yellow lights everywhere. And what? What's that? What's going on? Uh, and then I realized, he doesn't know I'm here. He's, He's coming, coming over into, into my lane. lane. Never, Never did see us, honked, did everything I could. Came, came right over into our lane, and I just came right over with him like we were dance partners, and right off the road and onto the grass. With a little bit of struggle, was able to bring it safely to a stop. After all, it was only about 17 miles an hour when that happened. And we watched him go off ahead. And about 50 yards in front of us was a guardrail and a drop-off. If he had come over at that time, we would have been pushed into the canyon below. Did I tell my wife about the dread? I sure did at that point. I said, you know, this whole trip I've had the sense of foreboding. My wife said to me at that point, well, we better be really careful from now on. You know what I said? Nope. It's gone. The dread is gone. That was it. God wanted me to be ready for whatever was coming. I said, it's, it's gone. You don't have to worry about it anymore. One puzzle, though, about the whole thing is, why didn't God warn me about the state trooper in South Dakota on the way home whose gun was not properly calibrated and had me going 63 when I was actually set for 55? I, I'll never understand that, but you're smiling again. Okay, I know that. All right, so there I have the real sense that was God. That dread came. I'm not a negative, depressive kind of a person. That was not a, this, the normal thing. And it seems clear from the results that that was from God. Now, Adventists are very leery of this kind of stuff. We're leery of impressions because we know that Satan is a deceiver. And he's going to come along and he's going to mess with your mind. And he's going to try to get you to believe things that aren't true and do things that aren't right. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So there's not just the Holy Spirit out there talking to you. There's somebody else. So how will you know when it's God and when it's somebody else? Satan will try to move you contrary to Scripture. He will try to move you contrary to how God made you. You know, God made each of us unique. And if you're a kind of fun-loving person who, who just can't stand it to be silent for three minutes, don't become a librarian. That's Satan's work. You know, if you're, if you're wired up to be with people 
25 hours a day, don't become a librarian, okay? On the other hand, if you can't stand people and you're scared to death to be up front, don't become a pastor. You see, God has a plan for each of us. God has a purpose for each of us. And Satan will sometimes try to get you off of that track into something that you're not designed to do. You may think it's the voice of God. So he can get you into self-promoting and self-serving, even for the Lord. So what do we do with all of that? How do we play safe in the midst of the voices inside of our head? And I would suggest there are four. Okay? Every one of us has at least four voices inside of our heads. I've heard them all myself. There's the voice of God. There's the voice of Satan. And then there's the voice of inner turmoil. I call it fog. You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes your mind just wanders into some really weird places. You don't even know how you got there. That's the inner fog, you know. So, so some of the voices in your head are, are crazy, you know. They're the loose screw up there somewhere, all right? I think we all have a couple of loose screws somewhere. Am I right? Can anyone say amen? You know. <laughs> so those loose screws are sometimes talking to us, okay? And then there's external pressure. It might be your parents. It might be your siblings. It might be your boss. Somebody of influence trying to push you in going into their direction. And you may not have talked to your parents in three years, but the things that they taught you may still at times influence your thinking. So how do you know? How do you find God's voice in the midst of all those voices in your head? And maybe you can come up with a fifth and a sixth if you think about it. So how do you know when it is God speaking to you? This is the big question, and hopefully we'll get to an answer sometime. Ah, there we go. All right. So how do you know God's voice? First of all, I suggest practice listening. Try this sometime, maybe tomorrow morning, okay? When you're doing your devotions, reading your Bible, reading a good book about God, etc., and it's time for prayer, don't just kneel down at the side of your bed or just sit there with your eyes closed. Get a piece of paper. Or you can use your phone if it's not too distracting, the notes. And when you're done praying, don't get up. Just wait. And write down whatever comes to your mind. Don't judge. Whatever comes to your mind. You may think it's from the crazy place. Write it down anyway. Okay? Write down whatever comes to your mind. Because if you're in the attitude of prayer, you'll never be more open to the Spirit than at that moment, I think. All right? So whatever comes to your head, write it down. Put it down on a piece of paper, a notebook, or something, and then experiment with it. You feel an impression to call somebody? Call them and see what the results are. I had a student once who, who felt impressed to, to do that, and he suddenly got an impression that there was a woman in Canada that needed him to call. And when you're a pastor and you get that impression, it could be a problem. Okay, so he wasn't sure <laughs> but where, where that was coming from, all right? But he decided that he had a safe way out. He called his wife, who was also in Canada at the time, and he said, you know, I feel impressed that so-and-so needs a phone call. Would you call her and see what's, see what's going on? Wise man. And his wife called several times. No one picked up. She called him back, and she says, she's not answering. He says, keep trying. I feel, I feel like this is really important. Keep trying. She called again, and this time the phone came up. 
She said, hi, she says, I'm just calling to see if you're okay. My husband had an impression that you needed a call. And the lady said, my husband died last week. And I just got home from the doctor who says I have cancer. And I was sitting here by the phone wondering if anybody cared. I think that student knew that was the voice of God. Observe the results. You know, sometimes you may call somebody, I don't know why you called me, I don't, I don't have any problem, no, no issues, you know, whatever. You say, okay, good, nice talking to you on my way. All right. Experiment with these impressions and see if something special happens or not. See the word toothbrush? I do believe in oral hygiene. I actually have a water pick that I use regularly. But I'm not the kind of person that's really obsessive about it. In, in other words, if I get a sudden impression, I have a free hour and I get an impression, instead of studying or catching up on something, drive all the way over here and brush your teeth and then come back. That's not me. I don't do that. I don't have those kind of impressions. All right? It's not that important to me. But... This one day, we were at a camp meeting, and it was uh, on an Adventist college campus, and we were in a motel in a very interesting neighborhood, you know, bullet holes in the door and stuff like that, police cars at 2 o'clock at night, so it was an interesting neighborhood. My wife was just not feeling 100% that day, she says, if it's okay, I'm going to stay home, why don't you take the kids? And so I took the kids to breakfast. And, and then, then I, I took them to their meeting, and then I had a free hour before it's time to speak. Free hours don't come very often for me. That sounded pretty good. And then I got this stupid impression to go back to the motel and brush my teeth. And I thought, come on, this is silly. This is definitely the voice of Satan. And it stayed. It, it just kept, kept on, you got to go back and brush your teeth. Go back and brush your teeth. Well, the motel was like two buildings, but the second floor was continuous, like a bridge. And there was like a breezeway in between. It was a hot summer day. And I drive over that, all right, all right, Lord, okay, if that's you, let me go. So I drove back to the motel, was going to park, you know, we had, a, we had a second floor room, going to park under the second floor room, but boy, the sun was right there. So let me drive around the other side of the motel and park over there. Maybe it'll be shady. And I got over there. Nope, not shady. But I parked there anyway. So I walked through the breezeway. And I was heading up the stairs when somebody stopped me. He says, oh, I'm from the meetings. You know, and I just wanted to talk to you about something. For 20 minutes, we talked to the base of the stairs. And, and then, then I went on up to the room, and the room was empty. So I brushed my teeth, came out, went back down the stairs, went through the breezeway, was heading for the van, when I heard a voice. And here's my husband now. My wife's voice. I turned around, and there was a man trying to encourage her into his motel room. At, at that, that very instance. I was happy to notice that he was about half my size, and he was instantly terrified. But the thought occurred to me, what if I hadn't brushed my teeth? And to this day, I have the feeling that was definitely God's voice. You observe the result. It's just a little thing, brushing your teeth. But if you feel the voice of God saying, go brush your teeth, there's probably a good reason. All right, let me go do it. Gradually, lifelong, when you experiment with those impressions, you begin to detect God's accent from the midst of the other voices in your head. You begin to gain confidence that when God is speaking, you know who it is. Some of these stories are a bit older. Let me tell you a more recent one. I was on an airplane 
flying to a conference of finance officers, you know, treasurers and so forth, for the entire church. There's going to be about 400 people there. And they were asking me to talk about biblical principles of finance. And so I was on the airplane with my wife, and I was doing some devotions there, and suddenly I felt an overwhelming impression. When you come to the end of your talk, do an altar call. What? That's crazy. We're going to be in a hotel, not in a church. We're going to be in a very secular place. A bunch of finance people, these are not pastors. An altar, I don't do altar calls. Some people are really good at it. It's kind of not my thing. All right, I let, I let the Spirit talk to people, and, and, and if uh, the Spirit moves them, great. If it doesn't, I'm probably not able to do it anyway. So I just, I was resisting. It really felt like it was God. It really did. But no, come on. This can't be. And I said, well, I know that accent. I heard that accent before. I guess I better do an altar call after this meeting. I had no idea what was going to happen. You know, when I got there, you see all these uh, finance types. It just seemed totally out of context. When I came to the end of my talk, I made an appeal and said, if you feel God calling you in this way, I want you to get up out of your seat, come right down to the front and kneel in front of the podium here in a secular hotel close to Disney World. You know what happened? About 60 people, like they were shot out of cannons, just shot up out of their seats, came rushing forward and knelt down in front. I had no idea. And there's another 300 or so there, and I said, all right, why don't you all come down and put your hands on them and we'll pray. And everybody surged to the front, and we had that prayer. What would I have missed if I had not paid attention? Amazing what God is often doing when we're willing to listen. Let's put some safeguards in here, though. Scripture, of course, is primary. If, if the impression is something that Scripture forbids, don't go there. You know, If you have an impression from God to leave your spouse and go marry somebody else, that's not from God. Because the Bible's pretty clear on that, okay? So Scripture is a safeguard. But so often, the Holy Spirit speaks where the Bible doesn't speak directly. The Holy Spirit, teenagers, can help you to pick the right job, can help you to find the right place to live when you're grown up, can help you find that person you want to spend the rest of your life with, and to do so safely and beautifully. The Spirit's ready to help you with that. But the Bible's not going to tell you that. You see? So Scripture's a safeguard. When Scripture forbids something, don't go there. That's Satan's voice. Accountability. If you feel an impression to do something really weird, tell somebody else. I told my wife about the altar call thing, and she was kind of like, yeah, you better do it. <laughs> Sounds to me like a, that's not something Satan would ask you to do. So, uh, yeah, accountability can help. Check with other people. I like journaling. You know, keep those notes of the things that gone gone through your head in prayer. When God seems to be speaking back to you, keep some notes on that. And I like the idea of a book of providence, that when you have a story like the ones I've been telling you, write it down. Don't just leave it out there, you might forget. Write it down, a book of providence. God's active working in my life. Because whenever you feel down, go read those stories. It'll pick you right up. And I do have what I call the 70% rule. In my experience, about 70% of the time when you're really sure this is God, 
It, it turns, turns out it is. About 30% of the time, nothing happens. I don't know why. That's just my experience. Okay. I was fully prepared to do the altar call and nobody moves. Because that sometimes happens. You, you may be really clear this is God calling you to do something, but the results aren't there and you shrug your shoulders and that's all right. God sometimes changes his mind. Just, Just look, look at some of the prophecies, like Jonah, you know? Forty days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Forty days, 41st day, nothing happened. Jonah was pretty upset with God, okay? Give God some space to be God, is I guess what I'm saying there. But let me close someday. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> All right. Let me close with a story of how I got to where I am today. My story of the place and the job. Okay. Someday I could tell you the story about meeting that lovely lady over there. Uh, that was a really cool story, but not today. All right. Let me tell you the one from preaching to the seminary. I was a pastor in New York City. And uh, I've always enjoyed being a pastor. I've always enjoyed speaking to people like we're doing here today. But uh, people kept telling me when you get a blackboard or a whiteboard behind you and you start asking questions and getting everybody involved, that's when stuff really happens. Have you ever thought of being a teacher? And so over some time, I thought maybe we should explore that. And uh, when I asked if I, you know, would you be interested in having me a teacher? They said, no, you got to get the union card first. I said, what's that? It's called a PhD. I said, what's that going to cost me? Oh, maybe 150000 mm. All right. Well, that was uh, a barrier. But yet it was seen very, very clear God was calling me to be teaching pastors teaching young people, you know, going through college and so on. Well, if I got to go there from here, sat down with Pamela. She was amazing during all that time, and we looked at our budget, and we cut it. We decided to live on $800 a month in Brooklyn. One of our uh, fuel bills was $650 one January. You know, so we cut it tight. We budgeted, you know, as a friend of mine said, I've never seen anybody pinch a nickel harder than you do. So anyway, so we were working as pastoring in New York City and planning when we had some savings to go to the seminary and get that PhD. And that when we get there, uh, my wife would be the one who uh, would, would do some work on the side and help supplement our income. We'd make it through just fine. And so that was the understanding we had, but we also had an understanding that if a baby would come, that would be her first priority, not the other. So we said, okay, we can wait. And uh, a little while before we were going to head for the seminary, we realized that we were pregnant. And we're so glad that we were pregnant, because look at what happened <laughs> over here. We would not know Jean. We would not have Julian and Kay and Tammy, etc. I mean, this is a wonderful thing, right? But what about the whole thing about teaching and PhD and all that stuff? Because the money we had saved was considerable for us, but it was way short of what people were saying we needed. What are we going to do? Now, we lived in a duplex in New York City. That is where you have two houses with small front and backyards. And by small, I mean something you could fit right in here, okay? That would be the backyard, and then the front yard would be that amount, and that's it, you know? And the ho two houses attached to each other in a driveway that you can just barely make it through uh, with a little garage at the back. So we were living there, and the landlord lived next door, which was great. He was a lawyer. And uh, uh, they were wonderful neighbors, neighbors and uh, we'd, we'd often sit in the back porch just talking across 
you know, because we were like that close, uh, just talking, etc. And so I went first to the conference president and says, you know, uh, we need to stay for a while if that's possible because we don't have the money. He knew about our plans, but I said, we need to stay at least another year so we can save up more money. And he says, we'd be happy for you to stay. Let's do that. And so then the only question was the landlord, because he'd already promised our house to somebody else. And so I said, Mike, I said, we have a problem. I said, we need to stay here in New York, and uh, we need to stay here. And he says, oh, there's no problem. He says, I'm a lawyer. I can fix this. Everything's going to be good. He says, I don't have any signed contract. He says, I can break it. No, no worries. All right. We waited 24 hours. The next day I came to the back door and I saw Mike standing in his little backyard with his hand on the fence and his head down. He said, John, I got a problem. I said, what's that? He says, I gave them my word. I can't go back on that. I gave them my word. And I thought, wow. He says, you're going to have to move. And we had decided we're not going to move within New York City. If we have to go, we're just going. Money or no money. And I just walked up and I said, Mike, you are the voice of God to me. Because when a lawyer says, I gave them my word. So, it's the Holy Spirit on his heart, don't you think? I mean, he just said I, he wanted so badly. We were, we were like best buddies, you know? He was so excited that we were going to stay. He said, I gave them my word. I can't do it. I said, no. Lord, you're messing with us. It's all good. We're going to see what happens. And a couple of days later, a friend of mine who, I, who had been helping me in ministry as a layperson came up to me and he said, you know, I hear you're going to Michigan. He says, in my business, he says, there are certain things I need that you can help with. He says, I'd like to put you on retainer. I said, what does that mean? He says, well, I'll send you $300 every month, and then when I need you to do some research or write up some reports, I'll let you know. And I said, are you serious? You bet I'm serious. He says, this is something we need. So with that little bit of encouragement, we went off to Michigan, and that's kind of the way it went all the way through. Uh, just somebody here said, you know, the General Conference needs somebody to read these books and give a report, and there's $1,000 in it for you. And then somebody who was supposed to teach in New Testament at the seminary ended up staying in Australia for a quarter. And they came to me and said, could you teach a couple classes for us? And that man stayed away quarter after quarter for two solid years. I was teaching classes one after another. You know, it was like the widow's cruise. You know, it just never quite ran dry. And you know what? I could tell more, but enough is enough, because I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch now. But, um, you know... As, as, as I, I think, think about, about that, God provided when you, when you knew this was what God wanted you to do. I mean, it was, the depression was very clear. I needed to go and do this. And God has blessed ever since. I can only imagine what my life would have been like if I had not gone and the family had not been so supportive. But just time after time, and when we were done with that doctoral program, we owed nobody anything and still had money in the bank. You know? So, listening to the Spirit, I think, can be one of the best things we will ever do. And I encourage you, just experiment with it. You know, just write down stuff that comes to your head. Try it out, you see. Get to know God's accent. You won't regret it. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the stories in my life, my family's life, 
that have made such a difference. I thank you, Lord, that you're still a living God that walks with us today. And I pray that you would draw close to each one in the hearing of my voice. May each one have a sense of exactly what you have in mind for them next week. I pray that you would touch each of our hearts as we are open and willing to listen. We thank you for all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.